first Sunday morning of this new year, 2021. Happy New Year to everybody. Everyone said, yeah. Amen. <laughs> she was ready. She was ready for it. Amen. No, it's good to be together here January 3rd, a brand new year, 2021. Um, God's blessed us uh, with a new year. So it's good to see you. Um, how many of you have made a New Year's resolution? Anybody make one for 2021 so far? That's one. Me neither, to be honest. Anybody? Nobody. <laughs> or when you want to. Admit. All year long, I'm making resolutions. Uh, well, you know what they say, I think um, my mother in law and I were talking the other day, Brenda, what they say about New Year's resolutions? They just go in one year and out the other. Right? <laughs> I know a lot of you seem to have heard that one. I had never heard it before. Um, so, yeah, I stopped. I stopped making those a while ago. They last about a good three hours or so. Um, but it's going to be together today. Just a few announcements for you. Um, first of all, it was it was on the screen, um, scrolling by, if you didn't see it. If you have to submit an annual report, um, we have our, our um, annual business meeting on the 17th of January. If you have to get a report in, if you could please do that by next Sunday at the latest, um, that will give um, Pastor and Christy are working on just putting all that information together. That will give them um, a week, but we want to be as fair and respectful as possible of their time, too. So if you can get it in before then, it'd be great, but by next Sunday, the 10th at the latest. Thank you so much. Um, also, there are some flash drives left in the back. There's about 10 of those flash drives Pastor Michael made with uh, messages from 2020 and music. A whole bunch of goodies on there for you. You can plug them into your computer, synchronize them with other devices you have, and um, have all of that just great teaching content and music from the, uh, from the past year for you. So if you need one, there's some back there. And also just make note, also another um, joint deacon and trustee meeting. Just if you're involved there, make note of that. That will be um, a week from this Tuesday. It'll be on the 12th at 6 o'clock. So again, Happy New Year. Great to see everybody. Um, and we are going to um, open with a word of prayer. And then we will stand and sing hymn number 535. So let's pray. Father God, we just take a moment to pause and again to um, praise you for your goodness um, to us. You see fit for us to experience um, another new year here in January. Um, as our calendar just tracks forward and says 2021, um, as they say, hindsight is 2020, and that, that has a few meanings after this past year. Um, Lord, in just the circumstances that we found ourselves in, um, Many of them could be difficult, but Lord, we also need to make sure we're mindful to celebrate the overwhelming positive um, that we were able to experience, um, that you were still God through the entire last year, that we were still in your hands. Nothing can remove us uh, from your hands. And this morning we come together in that, in that spirit of praise and thankfulness and also spirit of confidence as we look ahead. Uh, 2021, still there's circumstances we, we find ourselves in and we can choose to either focus um, on those negative or we can focus on the positive and choose to uh, choose to grow and thrive uh, in you. So help us, Lord, this morning. Um, if our attitudes need to be adjusted right now, our heart attitudes, that you would do that work in us. And we come together um, as, a, as a collective body to praise you. And we come together to learn. We come together to figure out who we are um, in your Son, in Christ, and what that really means for us. So help us this year, Father. Uh, maybe it's not a resolution, but maybe it's a, a commitment we need to make uh, to be closer to you. And just help us to, to realize that, to admit it, uh, to accept it, and to move forward. Um, so thank you for today. Uh, thank you for what you have for us um, in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, take your hymnals, number 535. Great, great hymn today. Uh, satisfied, let's stand and sing together.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy little change in the uh, bulletin there. Uh, I'm doing quiet time. So today's quiet time is based on uh, Colossians 1, 1 through 8. And um, it talks about the righteousness. It's comparing righteousness to foolishness. And the commentary in, in your little book there, the commentary you read it, it really kind of struck me. It's like, what's, what's one of the most powerful things that we think of today? And it listed... Uh, Category 5 hurricane, and I thought of an F5 tornado. It, it even mentions an atomic bomb. I mean, I work with explosives. I mean, they're powerful. You know, what, what stuff can, what, what, what are other things that we can think that are just powerful things? And then what comes to mind is imagine the power of a microscopic virus that's changing the world. It's changing government, it's changing economies, it's changing uh, our relationships, it's changing how, our, how we deal with things, I mean, that's powerful for a microscopic virus. But, as this says, those are good candidates, but they can't compare to the power of the gospel, which alone can totally transform a person's character and change their eternal destination. The gospel message is powerful because it's not an opinion or an idea dreamed up by man, it's the truth. And people seem to suppress that truth so that that they can go their own way and make their own decisions. But, but changing somebody's life that affects their eternity, that's power. And I might be going off on a little bit of a bunny trail, but we seem to think, or we seem to look at the future. It's, it's a new year. Happy New Year, by the way. We look at the future, and we sometimes tend to say, how is God ever going to get us through this? But it's easy to look back and say, well, God has got us through this, and he got us through that, and he pulled me through this, and he's changed that life. But then when we turn and face the future, sometimes it's tough to, to, to look at it and uh, say, wow, this is the worst it's ever been. How could it possibly be any worse? And, and just to give somebody, just to lift our spirits a little bit, think about this. In the past, this 2020 was a crazy year. There's no doubt about that. And we think, what, what is the world coming to? But if I go back a little bit, when Lori and I had two little girls, 9-11 happened. And we thought, what is the world coming to? It's a crazy place. Go back to when my parents were raising me and my sister. The President of the United States was assassinated. What is the world coming to? Go back one more time, my grandparents are raising my mom and my aunt. When's the last time a country dropped an atomic bomb on another country? What is the world coming to? And you can go all the way back, history, 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 go all the way back, go all the way back to the Bible. What do you think the disciples felt when the man that they spent three years of their life, they gave up three years of their life, and the man that they knew as Jesus, he gets arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced. And I mean, capital punishment takes place in a matter of a few hours. They had to have been thinking, what is the world coming to? But those guys got to experience the resurrection. And that's what really changed them. And that's, that's the power that each one of us can experience when we trust that Jesus is our Savior. So when we pray today, I know we pray for health issues and economies. We pray for our friends. We pray for our neighbors. But let's not forget to pray for the salvation of those around us that we know um, that God would reveal himself to them. And he would soften their hearts so that they could receive the same power and experience that change. So let's do that as we go into our prayer time.
right? In that, in that spirit, and we're going to stand in the same waymaker today. That waymaker, that that promise keeper, that light in the darkness. That's who our God is. And then we have a new song on the second with a chorus that you will probably, if you're like like me and my family, I've been singing it all night and all morning. Um, just four lines, just about Christ being magnified. So look forward to singing that one together as well. So let's sing Waymaker this morning. Keep 
We're creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry.
be able to gather. Um, and I'm just bless Pastor as he speaks and shares from the word um, this morning. And bless the rest for a day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Maybe seated. Well, glad everybody's here. It's a new year. A little bit of snow on the ground, but that's normal for this time of year. Uh, I'm uh, so excited uh, to get to enter into a, a new season. Uh, many of us may have thought that as soon as the clock turned to 2021, the calendar turned, uh, that all of our struggles of the past year might melt away. Uh, but yet, yeah, some of them are still with us. And so I want to um, encourage you. I think there's really positive things on the horizon. Uh, before we jump into the message, I want to share just a few encouraging things, really from the last year and a half or so. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can go and turn to Psalm chapter 1, so I'm sharing these. Uh, these are the things that I always like to share with our, uh, our leaders, uh, with our, our deacon board, trustee board, uh, those that are kind of working on different aspects, both spiritual and uh, facilities and maintenance, those kind of things for the church. Uh, we go over some of these things because we need to be encouraged too. I know sometimes we, we tend to fixate on the, through the negative or the more difficult. It's hard to see the positive things that have happened. And so I just want to go back to when Christy and I first came to the church, uh, which was a, um, an amazing blessing for us. And if, if somebody had asked me, hey, so the first year and a half or so um, that you are a pastor of a church, because we were doing student ministry before, uh, you will spend a third of that time talking to a camera on Sunday mornings. Uh, if somebody had asked me if was that normal, if that was expected, I said definitely not. Uh, but the Lord has taught us a lot of things. And so when we first got here, um, one of the things we talked with our, our deacon board about was just uh, all the spiritual disciplines that we need to encourage our family of faith to be a part of. And uh, one of the most important was just reading our Bibles daily. So we started the, the Word of Life daily quiet time, and uh, that gave us the ability to, I don't know if you've had these conversations, to talk with each other uh, each day as we read the same things. And so that's for as kids, as little as can read, uh, all the way up to however old you are, you can have a quiet time that's the same passage. Now we have the little books, we do that online. Uh, there's also another app they've come out with recently, if you'd like to get onto that. I can talk to you about that afterwards. So and we started the quiet time. We've done that corporately together. Uh, one of the other things uh, we did, this was uh, about a year ago, we, uh, we completely redid the website. So I don't know if you've, you remember the old one and the new one. Uh, we did some, some great things with that. It kind of just allowed uh, us to get our information out there a little bit better. Uh, and then, as I'm just really excited about those things, kind of just thinking about what God would do, um, we knew for our, especially for our trustee board, that the baptistry was something that we wanted to think about and address. And from both a facilities and a spiritual perspective, if you haven't um, seen it recently, we can now baptize people in our baptistry here in the church. And so what a wonderful blessing that, I was thinking about the timing of that for last year around this time, and we were just beginning to have that conversation and praying and going, we really feel like God wants us to do this. And we voted on that, and really in a matter of a couple months, right before we were just, we were not able to have services in person. We finished the baptistry and had our first baptism in the sanctuary in a number of years. And so that's so encouraging um, to me and all the things that God has done. I want to just encourage you to start praying because I think this is going to be uh, a year for us of reevaluating, restarting, and saying, God, what do you want us to do right now so that five years from now we can say, God, we were faithful to do what you asked us to um, and let me just, uh, just a word of encouragement to you as well before I share with you what I'm about to. Um, we, we finished the window project, which was amazing, uh, and uh, we were able to, to raise almost all the money that was needed for that, just from uh, regular over and above giving. And we also had a matching fund that was given to part of that that allowed us to, to really have more than what we needed, which will actually push into what will be like a building fund. And so that's what I wanted to um, talk to you about. There's some things that we believe the deacons and trustee board in a couple weeks will share with you in, in a business meeting um, that we'd like to address. Some things inside of the church, aesthetics. When people first walk in, uh, what do they see? And so I want you to just start praying about that now. What, what is God going to lead us to do so that we might be more effective in the coming years? And so I'm not going to give you any more details. We'll get that in a couple of weeks, okay? And so today we'll be in Psalm chapter 1. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Uh, we're in this new series, New Life. Is anybody in a new life right now? Uh, I know we stepped into 2021 and uh, kind of a different view from Y2K. We thought everything was going to just shut down. Uh, we, our hope was that in 2021 everything would change and be the way that it was before. 
not quite been the case, but yet there is a hope. There's things that we see on the horizon. Uh, and so today's message is just going to be about living stable. Does anyone need, anybody need stability now? We think about a new life and having stability. Uh, as we walk through the Psalms, uh, there's just going to be this phrase I want you to remember for today. It's to delight or wither. To delight or wither. And we all kind of make that choice on where we spend our time, what we invest in. And really at the end of our lives, we'll have the result of whether or not we chose to delight in the Lord or wither in what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, so with that, in this new series, New Life, I want us to remember what our vision statement is. Uh, it really kind of defines everything that we're doing, everything that we're going to do. And it's this, loving Christ, growing the church, reaching the community. So everything that we do should be measured to that. So as you think on the Psalms and kind of how we um, ended up in this place, I know last year we were starting in the book of Ezra. Um, it wasn't exactly the place that I thought we would be. We went through the whole book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, and today we're getting into the Psalms. Uh, and I remember when we were first coming to the church, we were asked some questions. Uh, and one of them was, you know, what kind of pastor are you? Uh, where, where will you spend your time in God's Word? And I think a lot of people, um, seeing me being of the millennial generation, they thought, I don't know, the Old Testament's probably not that important to them. Um, but what God has shown me throughout this season is there's just as much truth and grace that we need out of the Old Testament as we do in the New Testament. And so we're going to be spending the next several months in the book of Psalms. I'm just kind of dealing with how do we transition from 2020 to 2021, and how do we have right perspective, and how do we seek God during this time. And so if you've read the Psalms before, you probably know they're a collection of songs predominantly, poems that have been written to God. Written by a variety of authors, though, so many people think that the entirety of the book of Psalms was just written by David. Uh, David wrote a lot of the Psalms. He wrote a little over 50% of them, but there's quite a few other authors in the Psalms. And interestingly enough, the Psalms as a book, they weren't actually compiled until the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So isn't it interesting, we kind of full circle, we come back to this time where Ezra, uh, they come back to Jerusalem, they're rebuilding the temple, and Ezra himself picks up the scrolls that David wrote, and these other authors wrote, and he puts them together as the book of Psalms. So while he's rebuilding the temple, he's also uh, compiling the word that we would have now, entitled the Psalms. Um, and so if you've never read it before, this takes the Psalms take place really over a vast period of time. Uh, we know that Ezra wrote a few of the Psalms as well, and David wrote a lot of them, but there are also other characters throughout the history of the Old Testament uh, that gave us some insight about what was going on. Uh, and if you were to read the Psalms in their entirety, maybe you just sit down and listen to them, uh, you will see that the predominant theme is understanding how to seek, how to follow God in the highs and in the lows of a relationship with Him, and how to work within the world and what's going on. And so with that, we come to our first point, stable thought. Uh, and that's in verses 1 and 2, so if we ever needed anything, we really want to start with stable thought right now. So in verse 1 it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Um, so if we were to think of well, what's a good place to start in 2021, knowing we're still kind of dealing with some of the same effects of the pandemic, everybody's still wearing masks, there's a vaccine, we're aware of that, we look forward to a day, maybe we don't have to wear masks. But during this season, what are the things we need to think about? Well, three things I want to give you in this first verse uh, are things that are really negative influences, uh, things I think we kind of, we get on the news, we watch that, we get worried, we maybe talk with someone who's not a believer, and they say, well, what are we going to do? There's this, now what do we do? There's this new thing that's popped up, but where do we turn in times of need, you know, difficulty? Well, here's where we don't turn, okay? Uh, here's uh, this counsel of the wicked. So in the Hebrew, it's the atza, that just means advice or purpose or counsel. And uh, this word is actually used in 1 Kings 12, Verse 8, and it says in that chapter, this verse 8, But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. Um, so if you've read through First and Second Kings, you know this is the account of Absalom, who uh, he takes over the kingdom from Solomon. Uh, Solomon has passed on, and Absalom's grandfather is David. He's also passed on, and he gets the kingdom, and he's given this opportunity. He is, he is uh, confronted with difficult decisions, and... And the question is asked, well, whose counsel are you going to seek? The counsel of your fathers or the counsel of your peers? 
Now, many times growing up, kids, you learned this, or we learned this, we all did, or if you haven't, you will at some point. The counsel of your peers sometimes not always the best counsel, right? Uh, it's not always, although you go for friendship and comfort in times of need, maybe they don't always give the words that you need in a time of a difficult decision. And what we know, if you keep reading Absalom, he forsakes the counsel of the wise elders who advised his father, and he said, I'm going to take the advice of my peers. And as the story goes, you know, the kingdom was divided, the kingdom fell, and now Ezra, who's compiling all of this, remembers what's taken place. He said it really started back here where Absalom said, I'm going to forsake the council. So this is why, and some people will say of, of Psalm chapter 1 that David wrote it. Uh, others will say since uh, Ezra compiled this book uh, on the return from exile, that he actually gave this as an introduction to the book of Psalms. Uh, and so either way you take that, um, either Ezra was thinking about these things as he returned, uh, as he compiled this book, and he goes, I wonder what are the things we need to remember. And the first thing is that this counsel of the wicked. We, we need to stay far away from the counsel of the wicked. And then we see the second thing, standing in the way of sinners. This word for uh, way is Derek in the Hebrew. It just means like a moral compass. So everybody to a degree has a moral compass. Most people would say you shouldn't kill someone. Okay, so that's a bad thing to do, right? Whether or not you say that you're saved or not, most people would say that's bad, right? Or at least it's going to land you in a bad spot, so we shouldn't do that. So a moral compass. And then the word that he uses here for sinners is the word uh, chata, and it just means reckoned um, to God as offenders. Now, when we hear sinners, especially from the New Testament perspective, we kind of think of, well, everybody's a sinner, right? Everybody's fallen short of God's glory. And while that's true, here in the Hebrew, what it means is that someone who has completely forsaken God, all instruction, all counsel, all wisdom, they do not pursue God, they don't seek Him, they do not belong to Him. And one of the places this word is used here for sinners, because it's not the same word used in the New Testament for us that we understand, it's in Genesis 13, 13, it says, Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, it's destruction and fire. So uh, you continue to read on the story what takes place. Well, they don't want any part of God. They forsake any instruction, any wise counsel, and that's what happened. They didn't want anything to do with him. Romans 1, 24, starting in verse 24, gives us a good picture of this too. It says, Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So we don't follow the wicked, right? Now this is different than just, well... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow my friend who's a believer. He seems to make good choices, but he makes bad choices sometimes. He's also a sinner, so what am I supposed to do? Now, this is not following the counsel of the wicked and sinners who would, who would forsake God completely. Okay? Now, we all make mistakes, right? As we try to make right, right ones, I have to pretty much constantly talk to um, Alana about that because I make mistakes too. And if she's hurt, I have to, I have to go to her and say, hey, I'm sorry. My dad's not perfect, right? So we make mistakes but we are part of the family of God. So that's the difference. And this next thing, uh, these three things in this first verse, the last one is sitting in the seat of scoffers. Um, it's kind of an interesting phrase in the Hebrews, the Yeshad Moshe Lutz. Uh, I know you're not going to remember that, but it's just a fun thing to say. Uh, but in the presence, uh, basically it's being in the presence of a mocker regularly. So I don't know if you're, you know, you're, yeah, I know somebody like that, right? <laughs> somebody who maybe jokes all the time, or now there's nothing wrong with humor or having a good time, but... What this first part of the Psalms wants to remind us of is that it's important not just to not sit in the counsel of the wicked, but to remember that if everything's a joke, then maybe something's wrong, right? And so for us, we know there's things that are funny, there's things that are serious, and, and, uh, and we love to celebrate what's funny, but there's also times we need to be about what is serious as well. So if you're, you're kind of in that presence of somebody who's always joking around, never takes anything seriously, maybe spend a little more time somewhere else, okay? And so now we turn to verse 2, and, and so we saw kind of these three things or these three areas we need to avoid, and so in verse 2 we see really two positive influence or things we need to be aware of, and it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And so this first thing is delight in God's law. Now, um, you might have you might have thought of this, well, 
Yeah, Pastor, I mean, I know we need to be in the Word. That's important, right? But this uh, word here uh, for delight is important. Um, it's, it means a little bit more than just, oh, man, i gotta, I got to read my Bible when I get up. Or when I go to bed, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do, right? But whether or not David's writing this or Ezra, what they knew was that a key to being close to God was reading His Word and delighting. So what does that mean? Well, um, the same word is used in 1 Samuel 15, 22, and it says, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? <coughs> Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. And so in this account in 1 Samuel, Saul was the first king of Israel, and uh, he was given the opportunity to lead, and basically what he did was made a series of bad choices. And one of the last bad choices that he made before God said, okay, we're done, I'm going to anoint David king. Saul goes into a battle that, that God has said, hey, you need to destroy the entire town, basically. You can take all the livestock, get everybody out of there. And when he comes back, he meets with Samuel. And the realization comes that... King Saul has not done what God said. And so in order to fix this, King Saul says, but I've saved all these perfect animals for a sacrifice. And Samuel, he looks at Saul and he says, man, you don't understand what God really wants. He really wants your obedience rather than your sacrifice. He wants you to be faithful to do what he's asked you to do rather than come up with something you think is better. And so delighting God's law, truly understanding it, not just giving it the, the lip service or the, the service of, well, I mean, I, I read the passage today, I did the quiet time, and you know, that should be enough, right? But do we really delight in God's word? Do we cherish it? Does it, does it change the way that we do things? Now, when it's talking about delighting in God's law, you know what they had at that point, right? Uh, when either Ezra or David's talking about this in chapter 1, he, he says this to delight in God's law. He's talking about the Torah, which is the word that's used for the law. And that's the first five books that we have in the Old Testament. Can you imagine, in reference to, uh, I, I delighted in Leviticus today. I delighted in Deuteronomy. Um, probably most of us would, would not say that we do that on a regular basis. But yet, David or Ezra, when they're writing, they say, in those first five books that we have, I delight in. So how much more can we delight in the 66 books of the Bible that we have, the full revelation of God's Word, when they say, I delighted in just the Torah? Man, the significance that it brings to us. So we delight in God's law. And the second thing, so this is, again, positive influences, because what are we kind of constantly hearing around us? The world is ending, or here's another reason to be sad or be depressed. Well, um, if God has us here, then it's for a purpose and a reason, and He's reminded us that you need to delight in His law. And the second thing is we need to meditate day and night. Um, so think, think on this, right? Um, now, this word for meditate was used in Psalm 143.5, and it's kind of a contrast to Psalm 1. Um, so imagine either David or Ezra writing this. If David is, he's kind of writing when he's first starting out. He's king. He's, he's trying to figure out what to do. But in Psalm 143, um, there's a little bit different picture. He says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. So, now I know for, for young people, right, most of you might say that would still be me, but for young people, how do we, how do we view God and what He's done, his, his works? How do we meditate on that day and night? And because it's not just enough, I think when we get up and we either read our Bible, we think on those things, that's good, but then how do we celebrate? How do we think on what God has done? Now, I know in this season, in 2020, we kind of go, oh, man, I'm not really, what do we really celebrate? Well, there's plenty of things to celebrate. There's plenty of victories. There's plenty of graces that God has given us in this season of difficulty. The question is just, are we meditating on them? Are we thinking on them? So, delighting in God's law, meditating on it day and night, thinking of His goodness, what He's done for us. And this is how we have stable thoughts. So here's the second thing. We need stable action, right? So it's not just enough to have stable thoughts, that to, to say that we are um, solid in God's Word. And, and I'm always just kind of reminded of this picture, like around the Christmas season. Um, I was uh, driving around. I was picking up some gifts uh, before Christmas. And I, I was trying to back into a spot. And it always happens to me. I don't know why. I don't know why. I was backing into a spot, and some lady comes flying up, and... 
by the way, I'm praying for you if you listen to this, but some lady comes flying up and, and, and right, right next to me as I'm backing into a space and it's like, come ah, ah, and, and drives by and goes, oh, what are you doing? I don't know, I was backing into a spot. But that's how people get, right? Especially around the Christmas time, the season, you get impatient. But what does God want to remind us of? It's not just enough to have stable thought, right? To seek God in these things, but we have to have stable action too, right? And how embarrassing would that to be, you know, to drive by and then you know, a lot of people like to still have like the Jesus, you know, fish or the cross. I've had that happen a few times too, and I just go, that doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? Uh, now everybody makes mistakes, but shouldn't we be about not only stable thought, right? but stable action. So in the way that we live, that should be exhibited. And so in verse 3, it says this, He is like a tree planted by streams of water. that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. Um, so this is stable action. So we're being compared to a tree. What? It's, it's rooted in this place. It's by this stream of flowing water. If you look throughout the Psalms, you see this idea of tranquility or peace or stability in walking with God associated with being by a brook, being by a meadow with some sort of uh, active body of water flowing through it because it represents the life that we have in Christ. And so this word, I love it here, it's the word for planted. It actually, better translated, is firmly planted in the Hebrew, the Shethal. And it's found in Jeremiah 17, 8. It says, He is like a tree planted by water, that sends out its roots by the stream, and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Uh, same words used in Ezekiel 17, 8. It says, It has been planted on good soil by abundant waters that it might produce branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. So we see there's a lot of these same things. Um, in the Old Testament, when it's talking about being planted or being firmly planted in a particular place by stream of water, because what happens for someone who's not planted close to a stream of water, somebody who's planted in a, in a desert or a forest, that when it doesn't rain, what happens? It doesn't produce fruit, right? It doesn't grow. In fact, it withers which is exactly what we've been talking about. So do we delight in God? Do we practice some of these things? Or do we wither because we're not planted by that stream? So when difficulty comes, we're going, we're, we're gasping for some sort of, you know, a breath or drink that we need from God, but we were never planted there to begin with. So maybe for some of you, you're just trying to figure out, how do I get back to that place? Well, some of these things that were mentioned here. So we want to stay close to God. We want to delight in Him. And here's the second thing here in uh, this section. So with stable action, because we want to have stable action, not just stable thoughts. Um, the chaff is talked about. And maybe you guys know what that's about. It says in verse 4, The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. So there's this comparison between the person who is, who is righteous, who seeks God, although they make mistakes, and the person who is wicked, who kind of like in the first couple of verses, there's, there's that understanding that if you're wicked, if you're a sinner, if you're not seeking God ever, even though you make mistakes, you're going to be like this, and it says, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. And this word here for wicked, again, is this idea of just being hostile towards God, being separated from Him completely, so not a believer. That's why the text is comparing somebody who's seeking God and somebody who's not. And this chaff, it's interesting to me. I always think about, so we, we've been here a little over a year and a half, and so I've experienced all the seasons, which is awesome. Uh, and I know when the Dimbowskis walked in, uh, our daughter's here, Anna, and so we're uh, just excited to get to have her here and talk with them. But one of the things that we talked about was coming from Texas, which has been our experience, to here, to this place. Um, and so Greg asked me uh, about the, the weather or the season, and, and I, I said, well, um, the, if the snow is still magical to me, have I gotten over the season? And he said, no, you haven't yet, right? And uh, so I, it's always something I think about. We've been here in the season, but one of the other seasons is harvest, right? So we see this both in the fall and the spring, and we're an agricultural community, so that's uh, something we're used to. But what I've noticed is even in town, so on the outskirts of town and all the way through the middle of Main Street, what you'll see is lots of things that have been left over from trucks that have collected. If you're lucky, you'll get a cabbage every once in a while. So, but most of it's just right. The chaff is the things, right? You see them bounce off and they're rolling in the street. Somebody will pick that up, so you should get to it soon. Uh, so as they're coming down the street, there's all that stuff that sort of comes off the truck, it's laying on the side, and what happens when you notice the cars are driving by, the wind from the semis, it's kicking up everything that's left. It's just blowing around, wherever the wind blows. 
Or if you have a strong wind, you hope that it blows you know, towards your neighbor, not towards you. You're going to get all that stuff, right, on your yard, on your house. Uh, and we think about that, and as you drive by through Elbe or anywhere else around here, really, you're going to see a lot of that in harvest season. And it's a reminder for us that there's a reason Ezra and David are comparing the, the wicked to the chaff. So where do we stand in a difficult season? Well, we stand on God's Word. We meditate. We remain solid in thought and in action. But what happens to people who don't have God? They despair, right? I mean, as soon as, soon as those things start ha happening, oh, no, we have to wear a mask. We've got to be on lockdown. Uh, the world is going to end. It hasn't ended yet, right? <laughs> so I'm going to keep following God. I hope that you do that, too, throughout this time. But the wicked, they're like chaff. They get blown by the cars that are driving by, every whim of society and culture. But we stay rooted like a tree that sits by a stream, don't we? And so here's the last thing. We have this stable way that results. So we, we're going to make a choice, and you're either going to delight in God, uh, you're going to be close to Him, uh, or you're going to wither because you make these choices throughout your life, right? Now, some people will say, well, I've been a believer for a long time, and I'm really kind of in a depressed state, or really sad. I think that comes with difficult seasons like this, but the choice is, what decision do you make historically? Have you sought God in the past? Are you, are you making an effort to seek Him now? Or have you just said, you know what? Forget this. It's too difficult. And God's telling us, don't be like the chaff. That every difficult season, every wind that blows, like what Greg gave us perspective on in the quiet time, we all, when something bad happens, we go, what is the world coming to? Right? But in this season, this is just the difficulty that we experience during this time and in our generation. And there'll be another one in the future. So instead of going... Man, we're just, by every wind of difficulty, we get blown around. We need to go to this stable way. So here's what it says in verse 5. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor, nor sinners in the seat of the congregation of the righteous. And so there's this, this question for us uh, of thinking about what it's going to look like. I mean, when we stand before God, Ezra and David both had this in mind. When Ezra was compiling and David was writing a predominant amount of the Psalms, which is where we'll spend most of our time in this first uh, several chapters as we go through this. But what are your thoughts? Now, as we stand in judgment, what will be the place that we stand in? As we walk through difficult seasons, will we be able to say, God, we were faithful, right? And, and look, nobody's going, hey, uh, nobody's comparing your difficulty to somebody else's. I know I've talked to a lot of teachers, and it's been super tough, right? Some of us who maybe already worked from home or like found it maybe even a lot nicer to work from home, uh, we're like, this is great. Uh, but other of us have struggled with that, right? Kids have not been in school too, and so we try to navigate that as parents. So I'm not saying it's not difficult, right? I'm not saying that this hasn't been a difficult season, but, but how do we want to stand before God? Do we want to have this stable way that at the end of our lives when we're in that place, we're not like the sinners in the congregation of the righteous because they won't stand, right? And the congregation of the righteous stands with the Lord. Because we know our, our eventual, our eternal placement is going to be with God. In fact, I read um, the first couple of verses of this passage at my grandfather's funeral uh, about a month ago. And um, it, was, it was one that I hadn't really prepared. It was one that I was, I was praying before the funeral uh, God gave to me. Uh, because this is who we should be. At the end of our lives, we should be able to look back and say, uh, this was our life. This was the way that we lived. That we didn't stand in the council of the wicked in the seat of scoffers, right? But yet we would delight and who God is. And that we would do that daily, we would do that weekly, we would do that monthly, yearly, and that at the end, when we get to this place, it says, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. So those who never followed God to begin with, those who never really trusted in Him, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And then in verse 6, it says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish and so here's this question, because I know a lot of us think, well, what does it even look like to be righteous, like in a time like this, when, when the season has been so tough and difficult, and we just, we're kind of looking to where even the positive, where the fruit is, and where the way is that we're supposed to be in, because things look so different. And I think Micah 6.8 gives us a picture of that. You've probably seen it on coffee mugs, or um, on a picture frame, or something like that. We know it well, but we may not know the reference. Micah 6.8 says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So many of you knew that. You probably started repeating it as I was going through it. But most of us don't read the part before it says, And what does the Lord require of you? 
What does he ask of you? What is the way of righteousness? And he says to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. So what's our direction? Well, we're trying to work out in this season of what does a new life look like? As we think, the last year was not good. We were glad to see it go. Uh, what is 2021 going to be? I think there's a lot of positive things on the horizon, but it kind of has to do with our perspective and whether or not we've been seeking God throughout this time. Maybe you need to make a change that as we walk through this new series and we talk about really these ideas of today just living stable. Uh, that's an accomplishment in a season like this, right? How do we remain stable in thought and action and in our total way when we come to the end of life? We ask that question, were we really stable in what God gave us and how he let us. And then we make that choice to delight or to wither. Uh, nobody can make that for you, by the way. Um, kids, no parent can make you delight in God. Um, that's a tough thing as a parent, isn't it? And you want to force your kids to go, would you just delight in God? And then everything will be better, right? But yet, each one of us has to make that choice. Parents, we have to make that choice to delight in God, or, and we're not going to be very good parent, parents. We're not going to seek the Lord. Grandparents, same thing. How do we delight in the Lord? As we get further and further along, we realize whether or not we actually did delight in the Lord because our life will be the representation, either a life full of delight. Most people, most of you know somebody who's super happy, delightful at the end. No matter when that is, all the different ailments and things that they deal with, it's because they delighted in who God was. Or we withered because we made the choice not to seek God, especially in the difficult seasons. And so I'll close out with this. I was uh, just doing some research. I was reading a story about an influential person in the church. You may know her, but I'll read what happened to her first. A young girl at the age of six. She um, grew up in the 1800s. You can imagine that. Uh, she was uh, struggling with inflammation in her eyes. And so her parents took her to the doctor. And when they took her to the doctor, of course the doctor gave her something that he thought would help, but an allergic reaction took place, and she was blinded. And so a few years later, this person... This young lady was a believer at the time, and she was blinded. If you can imagine the feelings and the emotions going into that, the difficulty that would come. She wrote this poem. She said, at age 8, just a couple years later, Oh, what a happy child am I, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented, I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I can't, and I won't. So... You want to know who this was, a great leader of uh, the American church. Her name was Fanny Crosby. Uh, so some of you may have known that, but uh, a, an amazing leader in the church. She actually wrote uh, poems and songs and encouraged a lot of people who thought that they were going through a difficult season. And when she wrote that poem at eight years old, she really kind of defined her life and the way that she would live. And so because of her life, we have uh, songs like, Tell Me the Story of Jesus, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and Hide It. My soul. And so how do we move out of this 2020 season? How do we um, have this right perspective in thought and action, and eventually the, our lives will tell the tale of whether or not we had a righteous or stable way? Fanny Crosby kind of captured it for us, didn't she? Um, she said, to weep inside because I'm blind, I can't, and I won't. So what perspective are we going to take? Not that it's not a difficult season, not that we don't need encouragement, not that we don't need somebody to cry on once in a while, right? We've probably all done that this year. But what is our perspective? What's our thoughts? What's our action? And what is eventually our way? And so maybe maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're a believer in here. I hope most of us are. Uh, and you've kind of just had difficulty in the season. I would just challenge you to, to pray over the Psalms. Listen to the Psalms. Especially Psalm 1 as we get the series started. And say, God, what, how does my perspective need to change? How do my thoughts need to change? How do my actions need to change? so that I can really have a stable way. And that's my hope for you. But maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. Maybe um, this has kind of been a strange message for you and you've thought, well, I don't know, am I walking in the counsel of the wicked? Well, here's the truth. Unless you know Jesus, you will always be in the counsel of the wicked. And so here's an opportunity for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus and know what it is to have a stable way. And it's this, that if you would admit that you're a sinner, Put your faith and trust in Jesus, believing that Jesus did come. He died uh, a life for us that covered all of our sins. And the scripture tells us if you confess that with your mouth, you'll be saved. And so what a wonderful gift that we get to have. Everyone does free access to it. Uh, let me pray for us, and we'll close. Father, we um, just come to you um, this morning. Uh, 
God, we, you know, we're not worthy in any way to receive your blessing, to receive uh, salvation. God, we're thankful for that. We just pray that in this season, as we walk out of 2020, going into 2021, um, that you would give us right perspective, that you would give us uh, right thoughts. God, we know that really only comes from being dedicated to spending time with you, to delighting in your word, that we might meditate in it day and night, to think on it, to think on the things that you have done, your goodness, even in the midst of some things that are tough. Uh, God, I just pray that our lives would also have stable action, that um, we would not just be about saying that we follow you, God, uh, and then our lives don't match up. Uh, God, I just pray you'd help us in that way. Uh, and God, just with this perspective in mind that um, we will all stand before you. And God, that question will be asked, did we have a stable way? Uh, where do we stand, with the wicked or with the righteous? God, you know it's not because of any of our merits that we receive salvation. It's because of you. God, I pray that we would, through just some of these simple steps, through our thoughts, through our actions, help us adjust so that we can have a stable uh, way. We love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, love you, church. Have a great Sunday. And uh, Oh, by the way, go Bills. Right? Everybody have a good Sunday. <laughs>